Hello and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday with me, Ryan, a.k.a. Sifu Messiah. This is a weekly show which covers everything from the world of Star Citizen over the past week. Links can be found in the description for anything we discuss during the show, so let's get on with it. So this week we have 10 for the producers and Around the Verse episode 41, but most importantly, we discuss the release of the Misk Hull series and see what they have to offer. Plus, we delve into all things cargo. You will definitely want to stick around for this. Just want to say a quick big thank you to Stuart Thomas who bought me a beer last week. A massive thank you to you, sir, and cheers. Okay, so this week we had 10 for the producers, which was Travis Day and Darian Vorlick. Chris Roberts is still in the UK directing the motion capture shoot, which he'll be there for a few months now. Hopefully we'll get to see what's happening and, and how well it's coming along. But anyway, on to the questions. First one being, can we retract the wings manually on ships which have retractable wings while in space? So like the Vanguard and the Hornet, they have retractable wings. And they say that in space there is no drag. So, you know, technically there won't be any use for them with aerodynamics, but you will be able to press a button and toggle between having the wings retracted or out and what they're going to do is they're going to attach thrusters to the wings so if you retract them in they'll it'll the ship will look a lot more streamlined plus the extra thrusters on the ends of the wings will then activate and allow you to travel quicker or maybe quicker acceleration uh, than having the wheel the wings out and if the wings are, are out instead of being retracted they'll allow you to maneuver better and you know you could maybe roll quicker but also your cross section will be more prominent and you'll be easier to to spot because of this anyway that's that question so the next question is sort of a two-parter will there be a sump for your heat i've written heart what an idiot which can temporarily store heat from your ship helping to decrease your ship's signature and the second question or the second part of this question is if the sump is full and you don't want to release there and then will the temperature in size raise uh, and how will this affect your crew and so the answer was that the heat produced would technically be too hot to allow it to be released inside the ship so you wouldn't want that and the did say that Calix, who was designing who designed the ship wanted the system where your heat sump tank would catch any over any heat overflow temporarily to stop it from spilling outside but it does cause wear and tear on your ship so it's something you could do maybe now and again if you needed to sneak past stealthily somewhere but by doing it you are a bit sort of like overclocking your computer if you you push it to the limits you may damage something somewhere but it will give you a temporary reduction they also said that they talked about this and it will lo- most likely be sort of an add-on item that you can get like an aftermarket upgrade sort of thing anyway question after that is will there be a way to physically control your avatar's gestures to point for example like you see in daisy you can wave you can point you can curse in a way you know flip people off and they they thought that they thought about this and they think in capital ships or maybe the carrack for example maybe but they did say that the command and control will support that functionality and once the functionality is there then they can pretty much do it on a number of devices or displays so hopefully we will see that they didn't give it a definite yay or definite nay but there's a good chance question after that is have you thought about bringing a facial capture rig to conventions to allow fans to be part of the persistent universe for real now that would be amazing I would love to have my face in there. Not everyone else would like to see it, mind, but I don't care. And they say, yeah, they have thought about it and they've talked about it, but as cool as it would be, it would not be economically viable in the immediate future because it's such a massive amount of work. They say it may happen later, but do you do they really want to task someone with that job when it would take a lot of time and effort away from the designers, the artists, to have to sort that out and, you know, take all the images off these cameras? It's, it's just not economically viable is what they say, so... There may be some time in the future when we may see it, but to be honest, their time and money is spent elsewhere, and I completely agree with that. Question after that, quite a direct question. When will the FPS module be released? Now, they said it's as soon as it's ready and it meets Chris Roberts' expectations. They say they are playtesting it every day, but are still finding things that need to be tweaked that they feel are missing. They say they want to get a maximum amount of detail and fidelity before their release. They've also got to do the WYS transition, which is sound. Well, maybe it's done, I think they said, but they need it needs work the physics need work item ports need work they all need integrating so as long as that is still needing to be done it'll all take time anyway the next question is how will the upgrade system work on ships and ship variants and this is pretty cool they say it's very much like building a computer they say they already have the 325 which has a better targeting system the aurora ln has a better cooling system than its variants they say each component will have an available size much like we see with the weapon sizes so your ship will be able to to have maybe a size 1, size 2 or size 3 CPU available for it. The better the CPU, the more data it can handle, which makes sense. They also say that maybe it may be that your avionics unit can hold a motherboard of a particular
particular size or that particular size which has different numbers of slots for say a better targeting computer etc but it may use two slots instead of one to make it better so it does sound like the upgrading capabilities for ships are going to be very very in debt and it does go back to a previous question on one of the other 10 for the 10 for series where they said you know will people be able to be known as great overclock or great upgraders in the systems or on particular servers and it sounds like that is going to play a part in it as well so if you really get good at this you could probably make some some money some uec within the game helping people upgrade their ships anyway question after that the last question can you explain the pipeline for setting top speeds and they explain that they've had a big discussion about this and there was a post that travis day read from i think someone within the company who went into great detail explaining why you know every ship should travel at the same top speed now what he says is that the current thinking is to allow every ship to travel at the same maximum speed but some will be able to turn better or maneuver better plus another big difference would be the acceleration some will be able to accelerate a lot quicker than others so this kind of keeps it fair so that no ship can ever really outrun another ship i don't really know with this one i'm sure that this post he read had a lot of actual space physics and science behind it but big freighters i imagine will not be able to travel at the same speed as like an m50 but in this sense does that mean that every ship will literally travel at the same maximum speed but some will be able to reach that quicker some will be able to maneuver quicker i don't know that's the impression i get what do you guys think about it i mean obviously cars have different top speeds with it being in space and there being no atmosphere does this affect this somehow i really don't know i'm not that smart so i want to hear your opinions and if you actually know put it in the comments please we all need to hear this anyway that was 10 for the producers let's get on with around the verse so on Around the Verse episode 41, we were joined by our hosts Sandy and Ben as usual. And they say that everyone is hard at work on 1.1.2. This is going to be the tutorial patch, which will also have background patches for the FPS module, making sure it'll work well. And they also mentioned that it was Ben's birthday last week. So happy birthday, Ben Lesnick. So on news from Around the Verse, starting with the CIG in Santa Monica, they're working on the shotgun software. This is a tool for ship assets, which makes everything a lot easier for them and also they say they are working on the cargo system which we will showcase hopefully on friday which is today for me anyway they should be putting out a design post with the release of the hull ships which we will be looking at later in the show on to ilphonic they said that sata ball the reason why there's so much focus on sata ball currently is because it's the proving grounds for the zero g gravity gameplay so everything they create for zero g animations gravity the way they hook it up it's all being tested with sata ball that's why we keep hearing about it now also they're working on weapon mechanics and balancing things like the recoil is being worked on and they're also switching from the f mod sound to w wise it's mainly going on in the uk but they did say that the fps will sound great and you'll have reverbs through the hallway so if you hear a, a gun fire while you are in why what you may think is a desolate space station it'll have this haunting crack going straight through the hallways that'll be very exciting anywho moving on to austin texas and their cig group they are reworking the male skeleton to work better with the motion capture obviously we know the motion capture is going on currently so they're reworking that to make everything fit in better they're also working on grabby hands now we heard about this a while back and someone in the comments said they think it's to do with picking up inanimate items around the hangar exit everywhere and you were right it's the ability to pick up anything anywhere and set it down somewhere else and they did say you can open a crate in your hangar or anywhere put something in it close the crate put the crate into your ship take that to another system unload the crate and open it up and then you can help yourself to the items and not only that but everyone can help themselves so i expect there'll be locks on crates but that's very cool if you have a whole group of weapons that you've just managed to to find on a ship you can put them all into a crate put them on your ship take them to your org mates and share them out for all the org mates to use very very exciting they also said that it'll give you the ability to decorate your hangar with certain items and as we hear from behavior you are able to put anything anywhere in your hangar you can move it around all the flare items you can decorate it how you please anyway on to foundry 42 they're working on the foley post-production this is a sound effect that you hear where they link sounds to pictures so if you hear someone or if you see someone walking on gravel there'll be someone 
doing this Foley post-production sound effect where they'll be walking on a tray of gravel just to try and create that sound. They say they are working on the heavy armoured marine and they've got metal lugs from scaffolding for the armour sound. So they're clanging that around to create this armour sound. Also, they're using hockey uniforms to give that sort of balance and the weight of a human being walking with it. They also say they're working on the gun sound. And again, the WY setup, because that's being implemented, they say there'll be different environments which will cause the guns to sound differently. Very much like Battlefield for the way that they said they said their sound for weapons sounds great. It'll be very much like that. Anyway, after Newsom around the verse, we joined Alexis and she interviewed behaviour in regards to hangar flare. Now they talked about their inspiration, the methods, the limits of what they can create, and also they mentioned they're working on the Jean plant. But they did, as I mentioned before, mention that when the hangar room system comes in, you'll be able to pick up your jam plant or maybe a display case and move it from your main hangar to another area. So you can completely rearrange your living space in your hangar. Also, they said that there's a new collection of space oddities coming out. One of them is a piece of Ellis, one of the planets in Ellis, which was destroyed by its moon. Apparently pieces were collected up and now distributed for sale and we get a piece. Anyway, once we finished there, we met with Matt Sherman and Mark Bent and they were talking about the physically based damage system which they are shifting over to. They say that before damage was all handcrafted so it took a long time and it wasn't as high fidelity as what it is now with this physically based damage. They say the bullet speed and mass will determine the damage so it's not just this particular gun causes this much damage. It'll actually be the mass and the speed of the projectile. Energy based they said is not solely on velocity it's to do with energy density and so gameplay wise when you're looking at weapons you'll be looking Looking at the mass and the and the speed capabilities, not just you know 45 damage for this weapon. It's all going to have to be matched up, and it sounds very exciting, and very involving, and I can imagine it'll look fantastic as well. Especially what we've seen with the Gladius damage tech, it is absolutely awesome. So if that is going to be playing into the FPS as well, oh, I cannot wait. Anyway, Bug Smashers was back this week with Mark Bent, who obviously skipped chairs, and he was talking about the turret bug. Obviously, turrets now are available for two players. You can go in Arena Commander and. and sit in each of the ship but what was happening was the turret would randomly rotate to focus on an asteroid or a player or even the center mass and you couldn't lock onto what you wanted to so he goes in to explain what he did to solve that problem so Lance Powell sat down with Steve Bender to talk about animation and in particular the mocap and what they've been up to Steve said he had spent about three weeks down in London working on the motion capture hooking up all the different animations for the ships and everything and he goes on to explain that they've done the mocap for a stock rifle, the heavy armor while using the firestorm weapon, the vandul, and some PU actions including the arc core bar. Now they also said that they've worked on aircraft carrier shooters that fire off the jets. So this must be how we see things take off from say the Bengal carrier and other ships. He also said they're working on the realistic weight shifts that a character or a person has when he's changing direction. And rather than your sort of FPS instant change where you can go from one direction to the next without any implications, they want to make it feel more realistic. And this is where it'll play more with it not being a Twitch play FPS. It'll be a slower based tactical game where your body will have to manoeuvre using real physics in order to change direction, which will look really, really good. Also, they're working on the Arena Commander ship entering and exiting exiting and they said that they built pretty much as many of the ships they could on set and they're working on three different ways to enter and exit and they've got the normal they have the combat and they have the emergency now obviously normal is what we see currently you casually get into your ship or casually get out they say the emergency is when you've got to get out of there quickly so for example they say if you turn around and see a load of vandal coming or someone's trying to shoot at you you want to be able to get into your ship quickly and at the speed to get into the ships now it's not quick enough so that is brilliant i did actually think about that myself Self once in a while. He also mentioned that Chris Roberts was looking for a particular alien look with the Vandal and it sounds like they may have found it so it would be very very cool to see how the Vandal look. I hope they're sort of quite scary so if you turn the corner and see a couple of them looking at you you'll uh, actually shit your pants. They say there's loads of animations while on board ships so it's taken a lot of time because Something like maybe the Retaliator, for example. He didn't say this, but I can imagine there's hundreds of different animations of actions you can do on the ships. They all need to be motion captured. It's a big job. So back to Sandy and Ben, and they mentioned that there's only a handful of Gamescom tickets left available. If you are still wanting to go, get in there quick, because it sounds like they are depleting pretty pretty swiftly. Anyway, they also mentioned that baseball caps are here. You have Snapback and Velcro. They should be in the Pledge Store right now. I'm still waiting to get hold of some. This is Friday, so I'm sure they'll be here 
here later today, and I'll be picking some up. Although I don't wear baseball caps, I look stupid because I've got a small head. Also, they mentioned that 1.1.2 is coming soon, so check the PTU first. It should be up hopefully by Sunday. We'll have to wait and see. And the Hull sale, which we will hopefully get on to next, including the cargo pieces. I'm very excited about it, and I cannot wait to, to delve into what these Hull ships are like. Anyway, the sneak peek. At this current time, I am not sure. I My guess right now on Friday is the small smallest of the Hull series, probably the Hull A, maybe the B. But until we see the actual images, uh, I, I have no idea. I hope I'm right. Anyway, that's Around the Verse. Let's take a look at the Hull series. So to coincide with the launch of the Hull series concept sale, they put out a design post regarding cargo. Now, obviously, when you look at the Hull series, lots of questions arise as to how cargo will actually work. And it's the first time we've really seen a comprehensive analysis of, of what cargo is in, and how it's involved in the game. And it's pretty exciting. So they started by explaining in Arena Commander how the focus currently is purely on action and while space battles are exciting and a core element of Star Citizen they will not be the be all and end all of the universe. They said that one of the next most important steps in Star Citizen development is the cargo system that allows players to more fully interact with the environment. They did say that cargo is deeply important to, to expanding Star Citizen's gameplay whether you're using it to customize your environment to build a shipping empire or just to run black market goods from advocacy patrols. A comprehensive cargo system will enable Star Citizen to build a real world full of varied gameplay opportunities and my god it is awesome so in the past space games have solved the cargo problem by separating the player from what is actually being transported for example your cargo would just be an icon in a menu telling you your ship is now loaded with that particular cargo load for star citizen they wanted more than just a cargo manifest it's a first person universe and you should be able to fully interact with whatever you happen to be shipping and with that in mind they set out to create a system that allows for maximum interaction directly with in-game objects. So how do these interactions work? Well the design team has determined that there are five essential use cases for cargo objects in the game environment and each case must be developed in-game to give you full control over your cargo and items. So the first use case is player to item. The player must be able to physically manipulate objects in the game world whether it's a frag grenade, a Chris Roberts bobblehead or a Jeanne space plant. Your character must be able to grab the object with one or two hands and then place the object wherever it desires. The second use case is player to massive item. Now a massive item is any item that is too large for a player to reasonably interact with themselves. For example a ton of steel, a replacement hornet wing or a multimeter torpedo. These items differ from the standard item because they will require an in-game tool for handling. So anything from cargo drones to loader suits which sounds very cool in itself. The number three use case is player to container and most of us know or have heard about the store all containers which can be found on some models of Aurora which attach underneath there are two types of containers, uh, one being crate, the other being a tank. Crates hold loose items, so weapons, electronics, artifacts, personal effects, and even livestock, which is awesome. Tanks, for example, use fuel or scrap and, say, nitrogen, etc. Every container will include a port for a cargo jack, allowing it to be manipulated directly using an array of anti-grav pulses. Players will load their containers or acquire them preloaded and then position them above or attached to their spaceship. So number four is player to pallet and this is especially important for larger ships like the whole C to E which would otherwise take forever to load. So this allows for containers to stack. So using the grav planet which are giant mobile locking plates this can allow cargo to be moved in bulk rather than as singular crates. So the fifth and final state is player to cargo bay. This is the final state of how players interact with their entire collection of cargo in any given ship. This is where they developed a form Moby Glass and environmental tie-in to give pilots control over their entire cargo manifest and from this manifest they can view and they can track all containers and items on a particular ship. So all of this is, is built upon a requirement which is the ability to manipulate individual components at will. And what you'll see now, if not already, is something called grabby hands. And this is how it works. We'll have the ability to pick up an item and put it down on any surface we want with the precise ability to rotate it and even change its pitch and its yaw. So two-handed items will be reorientated, as seen in the demo, to simplify the attachment points needed for the animations to pick this up. Now with the flip coin demo, they explain how the 
physics engine allows you to manipulate an item and its respective gravity and other conditions and manually flip the coin by moving it up while releasing, which causes it to flip at which point it can be caught again. This isn't only about the ability to flip coins, it's about creating a system that gives players more control over their universe and allows new ways for players to express themselves through their interactions. So when holding an item you can look down at it and double tap the F key to use that item. While in use, double tap the F key again to unuse it and return it to the cargo state. This means that personal items you may use like a gun or a flashlight can be also stored as cargo itself, which is very cool. And every container has two key statistics. Now the first one being the standard crate units or SCU, the second being number of ports. So SCU defines the exterior dimensions of the container in cubic meter increments. The number of ports define how many discrete slots into which items can be placed are available. So ports are 0.25 meter spaces. And so an example is the container is say a two standard cargo unit, which is a 63 port container. Items are also rated on their number of ports they occupy when placed into a crate. So for example, a pistol will occupy one port, a rifle two ports, missile six ports, etc, etc. When an item is released inside the containment field of the crate, the item latches onto the nearest port and animates into place. So it's automatically taken and popped into the crate. So to do with containers and pallets, obviously loading 50 individual containers would not be fun or ultimately realistic either. So a system must be put in place to allow bulk loading of the same cargo. Now the player will interact with very large containers and pallets, often so large that they will obscure visibility. To counter this issue, the cargo jacks that we see that you can use to move these containers around with include a UI interface depicting the local area to the player, much like what we see in Arena Commander now with the landing assist UI. So this will allow the player to manipulate the cargo with, you know, precise and intentional movement. So in regards to the cargo bay, the standard cargo unit value determines the exterior dimensions of containers as we know, which is important to note because it obviously correlates with the standard cargo unit capacity within ship's cargo bays. Containers are placed on locking grids, as we can see here, which mark out floor to the ceiling where cargo can be stored on board a ship. Now the technology that drive these locking plates only require power to charge and will secure even unboxed cargo as long as it's fully within the locking area. The locking plates when active will be lit with a gold light and when that light turns red it means that something is wrong and if a plate is too damaged to maintain the lock any item atop of the plate cannot be secured. So as mentioned before when it comes to interacting with your ship's cargo the player must be able to interact with it using the ship's onboard manifest. Now with this you can sort of activate or deactivate locking plates you know to jettison your cargo. You can set orders for arranging the cargo and you will actually see the effect that it has on your ship's center mass and the ship's performance will be tied to the mass and volume of what you decide to load. And they're currently developing the UI for this system where you can see your manifest and they say they are proud to present the mock-up of the current version and so I'll show you some pictures if not already of this mock-up and it looks amazing. Anyway this is this is the cargo post. This is their ideas of what they they are working towards. I think it looks amazing and in, in a couple of the actual vi little videos from Vimeo we see what looks to be either the the whole B or the whole C. I would say it's the B, the sort of freelancer size. And it also shows us what could be the interior. But anyway, that is Cargo. Tell me your thoughts on it. I'd love to hear your, your opinions. So, as you have probably heard, the MISC Hull series of ships is now available for concept sale purchase. So if you are interested in picking up a Hull series ship which is focused on cargo, head over to the RSA website now. You can pick up from the A to E series, depending on what size you want. And also, the post about the Hull concept sale was out on Saturday. I shall go through it now and explain what each ship has to bring for itself and what it brings to the table, basically. Anyway, to start with, I'll read out the Hull series promise. So in short, the MISC Hull series of ships is how cargo gets from place to place, an interconnected system of ships designed around the same principles and intended to share the same equipment and maintenance process. MISC has created the Hull A through E to provide countless options for every type of merchant. From a single person Hull A to a supermassive Hull E bulk freighter, there's a ship for every job. Each ship includes a manned cab, a 
drive unit, a telescopic cargo spindle. When laden, the spindle expands to accept cargo pallets. While unloaded, the spindle unfolds for faster, more maneuverable travel. And we can see a little snippet of that if I put it up at the right time. So, starting with the smallest of the hull series, this is the hull A. I'll show a little, oh, a few, few pictures of them. So it's the smallest, the most affordable, and it's great for those just striking out in the galaxy on their own. Not too dissimilar to the Aurora or the Mustang, but it does lack that jack of all trades nature where the others trade cargo capacity for firepower and speed the hull a is a hundred percent on mission transport additionally though the hull a or b are often used as station to orbit ferries so when you dock your let's say for example your address any ship that's too big to land planet side it'll be a hull a or a hull b that has been kitted out to ferry people back and forth from the planet so the stats of the hull a they measures 22 meters in length it has a mass of 14,303 kilograms said it's a one person crew 75 standard cargo units of capacity one tr5 thruster two size one gimbaled mounts and then it says the rest of the information is still to be determined now i will say this now and i'll say it at the end all the information we hear about ships are true to that time but are subject to change depending on certain aspects that arise later on in development so moving on to the hull b this some more pictures of this one it is the more rugged option most often compared to misc's own freelancer and again Again, the hull B is purely for cargo, so it's often used as corporate support ships and not uncommon to spot several different liveries during a space flight, a single flight. So you can probably see lots of these ships out with all different branding on the side of them. Very cool. Anyway, the, the length of this is 49 meters. It's 69,137 kilograms cargo mass, so it's a hell of a lot heavier than the hull A. It says it's a one person crew, but that may be an error. It may be needing only one person, but don't forget, you know, you can have as many people people as it can handle on board to help you out it doesn't mean that you can only have one person on board it and it also has a 600 standard cargo unit capacity now thruster wise you've got two tr8 primary thrusters and there are two size two gimbaled mounts and again the rest is still to be determined so moving on to the hull c and these things are starting to get bigger so often called the most common ship in the galaxy it is the most produced of the range and is considered by many to be the most versatile its intention is to hit the sweet spot between smaller range cargo ships and the massive super freighters which we shall see soon it offers the expansive modularity of larger ships while still retaining a modicum of maneuverability of the lower end range now this is 105 meters in length so it's getting pretty big 298,419 kilograms of mass and it's a three-person crew also the cargo capacity is 4,800 standard cargo units now this has six tr8 primary thrusters six size two gimbaled mounts and two size one gimbaled mount so this is a massive step up just like the step up from a to b was now the hull d so this is to be the second largest of the hull series and it kicks off the large end of the spectrum with a massive ship built around a rugged frame it says it's affordable enough to be operated by a mid-sized org or company often used as the flagships for mercantile operations but their bulk means that they should be operated with escort fighters while not in safe space the uee military uses modified hull d's as part of their supply chain arming and refueling soldiers on the front line so it's very useful for that by the sounds of it now it's almost twice as long as the hull c it is 209 meters in length it weighs 1 million and 58,057 kilograms and it's a five-man crew and this has 21,600 standard cargo units anyway it has seven tr10 primary thrusters six size three gimbaled mounts and two size two gimbaled mounts and if you thought that was a beast the next one the hull e this is the largest ship available it is also the largest specialized available on the market today they say generally owned by major corporations and operated with a high degree of planning so anyone planning to operate one would need to think very carefully about what to equip on the turrets and providing escorts due to its lack of maneuverability which obviously means and makes it very very vulnerable to attack their potential load and modularity is unparalleled however no ship allows as much room for store goods or to be modified towards another role so it's a very very versatile ship it did put a little warning on 
this one, where it says, the massive cargo capacity makes it a target for pirates and raiders. Hull E's are typically used in safe sector trade routes and are operated as part of a fleet. So obviously these trade routes that we will see that if you are a, a small time cargo, like for myself, if I'm moving stuff around in my Aurora or in a freelance or whatever, I will most likely stick to cargo trade routes because being such a small trader at that point, you cannot afford escorts. It'll be just be a waste of money. So you need to stick in these, these cargo lanes, which these trade routes, which I, I would assume would be policed, will be safer than taking the quicker route. Anyway, it says also getting geared up to operate the Hull E at full capacity will require a significant investment in terms of credits. A single load of cargo is typically more valuable than the ship itself. So it says the Hull E operating is not for the faint hearted. So you must have a big group behind you with plenty of escorts, plenty of men to, to man the turrets and just know what you're doing or have the plan set up and ready. Anyway, it is 372 metres in length, which is huge. 3,241,052 kilogram mass, a five-person crew, just like the Hull D, but this one carries 153,600 standard crate units. So this is a massive beast. Now also it has 10 TR-13 primary thrusters. That is massive. Six size four gimbaled mounts and two size three gimbaled mounts. This thing is an absolute beast. If you can afford one of them and you've got one, make sure sure you have enough people to help you move it around the verse but I'm sure you can make a lot of money from it anyway talking about the spindle because as Ben said on around the verse it's not what we expected and it isn't what I expected I looked at it and thought oh shit what have they done but the more I look at it the more I think actually this looks fantastic now the spindle we see it says it's a standardized spindle found on all five members of the whole series as we know it's just basically the size of what it can carry that's changed and it's capable of securely attaching many types of cargo containers ranging from standard store or big box containers containers to specialized freight units equipped for liquids, perishables, parcels, and livestock, plus more. So yes, you can transport space cows or no. Brahmin if this was Fallout. Anyway, many manufacturers have created aftermarket upgrades which include shield generators and sensor suites to stealth cargo pods and gimbal turrets and other weapons which can take place of some of the cargo pallets on the larger ships. The Hull series is one of the most modular starships available, and that is from them. So, how does it land? Which is, I expect, on everyone's lips, what the hell it doesn't make any sense so it says that every ship in the whole series is capable of making a planetary landing while contracted so additionally the a and the b may land when fully laden but the c d and e will typically deposit their cargo at an automated orbital yard before landing to dock and then it goes on to say that they are equipped for water landings favored on low gravity worlds which will look rather interesting so yes basically you'll get into orbit of the the planet that you are dropping your cargo off drones or other the ships and crew will come in and remove all this cargo, take it planet side where you will take the manifest to the area you are taking it to and then you'll get paid and so forth. Very interesting, very unique and not something we have really ever seen in a space game before but then we haven't really seen a space game of this much excitement and fidelity. Anyway, it also points out that the whole series measures cargo in standard cargo units or SCU which is what I've been talking about. The previous ships, their cargo capacity can be determined by dividing the current capacity by four. So as an example, my Aurora LX has a cargo capacity of 16. This was the old style cargo capacity and using this SCU which is the latest idea of how cargo will be that makes it a standard cargo unit of four so not as much as we first thought you can have fun doing it and it is an Aurora you know it's not a delivery ship but yeah take your ship from the the stats page which will be updated soon and will be notified but take what you see there and divide it by four and that'll be the standard cargo units for your ship anyway as a side note it mentions that everything is subject to change as i mentioned before please do not see this and think right that's how it is and then later down the line when it changes go and complain to them because you were warned anyway tell me your thoughts about the whole series are you excited for them have you bought one do you think they look ridiculous i want to hear what you have to say i originally when i woke up this morning because i actually stayed up till three o'clock in the morning waiting for this post and it didn't come in it came in this morning when i woke up and i looked at it and i thought oh bollocks they've messed it up but over the time of reading it and watching it i actually am very excited for these ships and it would be nice to know if we can actually travel from one end of the spindle to the other end through that tube that looks like it compresses when it draws the ship in. I would like to know that. It would be cool to get from one end to the next without having to EVA. But anyway, tell me your thoughts on it. So also this week, James Pugh interviewed Lisa Ohanian in Meet the Devs. 
There was a new clean shot report, which for all you haulers out there, I suggest giving it a read as there appears to be pirate trouble in the Nexus system and haulers are the target, so check it out. We had a new galactic guide this week and this time it was focused on the Vega system. Very interesting reads, these galactic guides, always worth checking out. And also there was some new merchandise launched this week. It was in the form of baseball caps. You can either have the snapback or the Velcro. Unfortunately, all the Velcro appear to have sold out and there are only around 140-ish of the snapbacks available there. $20 each or $24 for all us in the UK. If you are a collector of the merch, pick one up now. So I'm afraid to say that next Sunday there will be no Star Citizen Sunday. I'm heading out camping on the Thursday and by the time I go, the only thing available for me to report on will be the 10-4 series. I will be back the following Wednesday, so I shall endeavour to gather all the information from the previous week and get it all out there to everyone before the following Sunday. I do apologise to you all and we will be back to normal the next following week. So yet again we have come to the end of the show. I just want to say a big thank you to all our subscribers and a massive thank you to all our patrons. You are truly helping our channel grow. If you are interested or able to help us out in way of a monthly donation from as little as $1 to any amount you deem fit, check out our Patreon page in the description. This really, really helps our channel to create more videos, better quality videos, and it allows us to get better hardware, better software, plus it allows us to spend more time on creating the videos. Don't forget to subscribe, comment if you have anything to say, show me the love by hitting the like button and share it with all your friends and enemies. Thank you for watching and I shall see you in next week's show.